Hello, my name is Colonel Retired Bill Butler, Chief of Staff at the National Veterans Memorial and Museum. Thanks for joining us for our January Inspiring Story of Service. Uh, since it's the start of the new year and we're welcome in 2022, we're going to focus on health, wellness, and fitness. Joining us today is U.S. Army veteran Brandon Tucker, who's also a former Army Ranger. Uh, he's joining us today to talk about uh, his Guinness World Record attempt to break uh, the most muscle ups in a 24 hour period. Uh, so the current record um, will undoubtedly get broken by Brandon today. He's also the world record holder for the most uh, pull ups in a 24 hour period, having set a new record of 7,715 pull ups uh, last year. So we're excited for him to be joining us and welcome everybody. Brandon, thanks for joining us today. We're excited to. Um, to have you here. We're excited that you're going to do your world record attempt on muscle ups here on January 30th. Uh, before we dive into the description of what a muscle up is and, and the training requirements for that, if you can just briefly describe, you know, you know, tell us who you are, you know, where you grew up and what inspired you to join the military. Okay. Born and raised in Southeast Missouri, a small town. I was raised by my mom um, and my two brothers. I my dad served, my uncle served, my grandpa served, um, come from a, a military background. So mm -hmm. I always had, you know, strive to, to kind of follow their footsteps. And I guess that's what really motivated me to join. And then when you joined the service, you did a ranger contract to become an army ranger right no. off the bat, correct? No, no, okay. no, I, I, no, I went through infantry, um, basic AIT, and then ended up getting an airborne slot. And, Asked my drill sergeant, you know, because by that point they had all known that, you know, I wanted to be a ranger. So I was constantly just bugging my drill sergeant about a ranger contract. And so I went over there to the ranger liaison day one of airborne school, um, walked in and six foot five, just intimidating staff sergeant was sitting there. Um, asked me what the hell I was doing in his office. And here I am, Private Tucker, standing at parade rest, you know, shaking. You know, sorry, I want to be a ranger. What do I got to do to be a ranger? And he, he looked me in the eyes and he said, what the hell makes you think you're any different than the six guys that just quit on me today? Like, that told me the same story you're about to tell me. And I just remember telling him, like, I'm not, I'm not going to quit. Like, it won't be because I quit, you know, that I don't become a ranger. And, uh, yeah, he told me to write a two-page essay on why I wanted to be a ranger and have it at his, like, sitting on his desk the next morning. And so that's what I did. Okay. Stayed up all night writing an essay on why I wanted to be a ranger, and then went back the next day, read it to him, and ended up getting the getting the slot. All right, that's awesome. So you go to RASP one, make it through that, and then mm -hmm. you go off to Third Ranger Battalion for your first assignment. Tell us a little bit about both RASP, and what that is, because a lot of people don't know, and also about your you know first couple of years in Third Ranger Battalion. Yeah, so RASP is Ranger Assessment Selection Program. So it's eight weeks. Um, the first few weeks, it's pretty much just getting smoked and doing lots of push-ups and just, you know. But after that, there's a lot more learning involved and a lot more training, you know, the actual individual soldier and a lot of um, mobility training and things like that. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a, a test. So how many started in your RASP class and then how many graduated? Uh, Any know. ideas? No, I know it was at least a third of us left, maybe. Okay. I mean, there wasn't a lot of us. I would say probably 30% made it. Yeah, that, that seems to be pretty true with what I've, my experience yeah. has been. Okay, so then you, you graduate RASP, you head off to right down the block to 3rd Range Battalion, and then, so what do you do? You know, you're assigned there, and, and you know, tell us a little bit about your duty there and duty position you held and deployment experience and that, that sort of thing. I served almost eight years in 3rd Ranger Battalion, started out in Delta Company, um, took my first job as a squad automatic rifleman, um, went through my first deployment to Afghanistan, and then immediately following that deployment to, I think we were in Kandahar, um, got back and went to Ranger School. Mm -hmm. um, went straight through Ranger School, graduated Ranger School, and then once I got my tab, Shortly after that, I took my first fire team. Okay. So. And so you're a fire team leader for how long? Yeah, I was a fire team leader for 
probably two years. Okay. Um, two deployments as a fire team leader, and then actually got pulled over to Charlie Company and took a squad shortly after. Okay. So I would say about five years to get to make staff sergeant. Mm -hmm. it's five or six. Okay. I was fast tracking. I mean, e six and under rough. six is impressive. And then, um, so you get some bad news, and and you have some medical issues, and mm -hmm. and unfortunately you've got to leave the army. Uh, tell us just a little bit about that, and um, you know how, how you kind of wrapped your head around uh, not being able to do something that you love doing, and how that impacted you know kind of your psyche and some things that you did to overcome that. Yeah. So. Right before I got my E6, or went to my E6 board, and I'll get to that in a second, but my mom and a guy that I considered to be a stepdad, he was with my mother for 13 or 14 years. Um, they both died in a car accident. I was actually in Florida on pass, and I got the phone call and immediately jumped in my truck. Five minutes going down the road, that, you know, they told my uncle called me crying and said that you know, your mom's, she's gone. And, so is Chris and went home, had a, you know, put in a Red Cross message mm -hmm. through my platoon sergeant and um, I had to bury my mom in a week and then packed all of her stuff up and put it in a storage shed and drove back to Fort Benning. And Monday morning I sat through my E6 board. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> I passed. And uh, I, one thing I, We'll bring up just because I think it was, it was pretty cool of the sergeant major, but I don't think he realized initially going into that E6 board that I was the same Sergeant Tucker that put the Red Cross message. And, um, you know, they send you out and they bring you back in. And uh, as I reported the second time, he told me just to sit down, man, sit down. And he's like, are you the same Sergeant Tucker that put in the, the mm -hmm. Red Cross message? And I said, Roger, Roger Sergeant Major. And... Uh, he was like, look, man, you came in here with such composure and to like go through something like that and to be able to come in here after, you know, burying your mom. He's like, you're absolutely promoted. And uh, I just remember he was saying that I was strong and it meant a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just to put this in perspective, you know, um, sergeants or specialists aspiring to be a sergeant um, have to go in front of a promotion board. It's a local promotion board, so it's, it's uh, the president of the board is the command sergeant major of the unit, and then the first sergeants, the E8s assigned to that battalion, uh, are also on the board. And then uh, candidates for consideration for promotion all go in front of that group. And I've seen uh, grown men that I've witnessed do incredible valorous things in combat, shaking um, as they're standing outside waiting to go in front of a group of first sergeants who are gonna grill them about their duties and responsibilities and their technical and tactical expertise. So the fact that you were able to um, you know, go through such a emotional tragic event with your mom and your stepdad, but then immediately turn around and focus on, you know, successfully uh, navigating that, um, that board is, is impressive. And ju just like your Sergeant Major told you, um, you know, that's exactly who uh, our country needs leading young men and women in combat. Kudos to you. That's awesome. Thank you. So then you get some bad news about um, yeah. medical issues that you're going through. And you, you yeah. So just as I thought, you know, my military career was continuing to progress and, you know, I just got promoted. Uh, we, I went through SEER school and that's when I initially... Can you just describe what SEER yeah, means? So, yes, yeah, so SEER is, is survival, evasion, resistance, escape. Um, it's training for basically POW training and, and, you know, if you're ever isolated, you know, in a foreign country or behind enemy lines, you go through SEER school. Um, but uh, I went through that, and anyone that knows anything about that school, you don't eat <laughs> unless you kill it or find it, or you know somehow the the forest gives it to you and provides for you. Um, but I was out there, and immediately following graduation of Sears School, I started seeing a lot of, I guess, you no know, 
clean way to put this. A lot of blood and, mm -hmm. and, and in my stool started noticing I was getting really skinny. A lot of people were like, Tucker, are you okay? Like, mm -hmm. Looking skinny, man. And no, no male wants to hear that they're getting skinny. I kept getting these comments like, man, you're sick. And went to the medics and they, you know, were assuming that it, you know, it's bright red blood is probably just, you know, a tear or you're straining too much or, mm -hmm. or something. So I kind of went through that for months and just kind of kept putting it off and just kept ranging on, ranging on. It just got to the point where it was really hard to, to hide it anymore. And um, that's about the time, because I had been seeing my PA and mm -hmm. stuff at regiment. And around that time, he was like, look, man, you're, you're going to have to go through the medical evaluation board. And um, have you considered mm -hmm. what you're going to do when you get out? And like, for me, I, I've never given that any thought. I was planning on staying in for 20 plus years until, right. until they made me get out, right. you know. So that was like another blow. That's when I got out and I really started to oh, ask the right questions, I guess. Like, who am I? Like, what's my purpose? You know, like I went from having it all planned out and what I wanted to do with my military career to, hey, you're out of the army now. You don't have, you know, some that like, guy to look to for advice. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of all on me at that point. And I just, I think I started asking the right questions and, and really started stopped looking externally and really started looking like inside who I was and, and what I wanted to do and kind of what, trying to find out what my purpose was from there on. Before you, what is that purpose? I, I hope to be an inspiration to people that, you know, with similar, you know, adversities or challenges and maybe show them that, you know, if you do go through a lot, it's, it's never the end of the road until you decide. The scene and to just keep fighting the good fight, you know. Uh, with that being said, what what exactly are you doing now, and uh, how did you arrive at at where you are today? For me, I've always been passionate about fitness, and I've always had like the dream of owning my own gym one day, and and just wanted to be in the gym. I knew that like that's where I felt most like myself. That's where I. It was my therapy. It was a way for me to work on myself. And, mm -hmm. and, but at the same time, I, I had the opportunity to take what I've learned from fitness and, and teach other people and, and help other people achieve their goals. And I just fell in love with serving. I mean, I've always wanted to serve others, and that allowed me that opportunity to, to kind of take the knowledge I had and, mm -hmm. and to help people kind of overcome whatever it is that they're trying to overcome, whether it's weight loss or whether it's just mental health issues or anything like that, you know, I want to help people. So based on that experience, are there, um, you know, courses, certifications that you would recommend? And if, if anybody's interested in becoming a personal trainer, nutrition coach, uh, that sort of thing uh, that, that you would recommend? Yeah, I, I went through the National Academy of Sports Medicine, so mm -hmm. NASM is okay. who I got my certification through. Now I'm going to school, trying to get my bachelor's in kinesiology. All right, let's um, switch focus a little bit and, and talk about the uh, pull-up record that you broke and set and then how that's you know, kind of evolved into the muscle-up record. Okay. So for me, the first world record, why I wanted to break a pull-up world record, initially I was, I don't know if you've ever read the book Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins, mm -hmm. former Navy SEAL. Yeah. It inspired me. A lot of what David Goggins talked about in his book, I could, I could relate with kind of where he, his headspace was, I guess, or mm -hmm. his hunger and why he is the way he is. I, could, I really could relate with the things he talked about in his book. And I just knew I was good at pull-ups. So I was like, man, I could probably do that if I really put everything towards it and really worked hard. I could probably break that world record. So at the time, the world record was what? 7,600. And then you said you were good at pull-ups to, you know, kind of layman's terms. I had never done more than 100 pull-ups in a day at that point. Okay. David Goggins said that he did like 60,000 pull-ups in preparation whenever he broke the world record. And just, I knew that if I could maintain the self-discipline and just never let, just be consistent in that, just mm -hmm. be consistent with the discipline part. Like, don't skip the workout. Don't. Like, if you're too sore to do the pull-up, then 
you know, regress it down to a, a similar movement where you're still working those muscle groups. You right. know, and, and, but I think the, the real reason on why I wanted to break a world record was the fact that I had lost my military career. I, mm -hmm. When I lost that, I lost a lot of self-pride or pride in what I was doing, I guess. I mean, yeah. yeah, I was still helping people. I was still serving. I was still giving back. But I, I kind of lost that pride that I had when I was a ranger. You know, like going from being the top, you, you know, amongst the top guys and, and going, being the lone ranger where I'm just a regular old civilian, you know, working in a gym. I just, I needed something to kind of boost my spirit and my, my self-esteem and right. give me that sense of pride again. Um, yeah, that's, that's something that's, that's hard for many veterans that I've spoken with is, mm -hmm. you know, lose your identity and then you've got to, you gotta figure out what you're gonna do next. Yeah. And I was always joking, all right, I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do when I grow up. Yeah, uh, still trying I was, to figure it out. You know, 49 years old when I got out of the army. Um, so uh, for the training for the, the pull-up, how long did, did you have to train to prepare to, to break that record? I trained for 14 months. Like actively started logging it, mm -hmm. my training for 14 months. Um, may have been a little longer. So how did you arrive at the date? Oh, so the date, yeah, so I wanted to do, I was trying to give myself an edge any way that I could because I knew what I was about to try to do was, it was going to be a challenge, probably mm -hmm. the hardest thing I'd ever done. And I knew that if I had any kind of mental edge, and I knew that that day that my mom died would be a day that when I felt like quitting, I could, I could look back at that. Yeah, for sure. And know that, hey, don't quit, you know? Yeah. This, this day was a lot harder four years ago than it is today. Right. You know? What is a muscle-up, and then uh, why, why you know, a new attempt at a world record? So a muscle-up, to me, is like the next step from a pull-up. So yeah, pull-ups here, your chin's over the bar. A muscle-up is all the way up. Okay. To where you're extended at the top of the bar and the bars so you're coming all the way up and right. over the bar um so for me it was how do i one up a pull up it was like if i'm still doing a muscle up at 24 hours and i'm still performing one i will be very happy regardless of the number uh so the current record stands at what and based on your training and preparation to this point what do you think i know if, as long as I don't tear a bicep or something crazy happens and get injured, I know I can break the 1,256. Okay. I did a four-hour test the other day um, a couple weeks ago, and I was able to do 560 in four hours. So. Okay. Um, so the, if you just talk through, you know, how, how does a Guinness uh, World Record get certified and, and you know, some of the... Um, you know, technical requirements to make sure that it is in fact a world record, who, who, who mm -hmm. uh, keeps record of it, that sort of thing. Um, Guinness, they have their website. You can go on there. Anyone can apply for a world record. Um, but you, you go on, you, you tell them what, you fill out the application, you tell them what you're, you're going for, mm -hmm. the date, the tentative date that you're trying to do it. Um, they ask a little bit about why you're doing it. Um, but once you submit the application, you have a year to do the world record or to submit the evidence. And then they also, once they approve your application, they send you the guidelines for mm -hmm. the record that you're going for. So okay. for the 24 hour, hour pull up record and the muscle up record, um, it requires there be a coach or someone certified in fitness, mm -hmm. whether it's a personal trainer or someone with a degree in exercise science, there has to be somebody at all time counting the reps and making sure that they're to standard. Okay. Um, and then you have to have two witnesses keeping log of, you know, how many reps, the time, and there's a log sheet that they, they have, and then you fill that out. And then um, submit the evidence at the very end, 24 hours of footage mm -hmm. from two different angles, um, showing that you're coming up over the bar, right. um, the body's straight, there's no bending at the waist, or mm -hmm. cool. they have very strict um, guidelines that you have to follow. Um, so January 30th, we're going to do the national kickoff for the Patriot Challenge. 
Um, so if you can just talk about the Patriot Challenge a little bit. and Yeah, so the Patriot Challenge, it was formerly known as the Run Ranger Run event. Um, Corey Smith, a former ranger, but he got out and decided to run home to his family. I forget where it was. Indy, right? Yeah. Indianapolis? Yeah, Indianapolis from Fort Benning. It's 565 miles, and he wanted to raise money for, for veterans. And uh, we're doing it now. It's called the Patriot Challenge, and we're doing the kickoff here. Mm -hmm. um, it's January 30th. At the same time, I'm going to be kicking off the Muscle Up event and trying to raise money for the Warrior's Heart Foundation. And uh, uh, So can you just tell us a little bit about the Warrior's Heart, what that is and, and what they do? Yeah, so the Warrior's Heart, they're a... Um, a treatment facility, an inpatient facility down in Texas where they help veterans and, and not just veterans, but um, service members with addiction problems, um, PTSD, mm -hmm. and things like that. It's an inpatient facility down there. Uh, it's definitely something that's very common, and I think what the Warrior Heart's doing is it's definitely something to, to get behind. Um, so can, do you have any advice for any of our listeners who either are getting ready to get out of the military, you know, in, in transitioning, uh, or anybody that's interested in, in, you know, kind of starting a, a journey of fitness? I don't know. Don't be afraid to, to seek advice and seek help. And there's tons of programs out there for veterans. I mean, if you, if you get out and you're a veteran and you, and you, or one of those veterans that are like, there's nobody that supports me or anything like that. I, I just don't believe that. I think there's an ample amount of things mm -hmm. and opportunities and programs and just seek help. Don't be stubborn. Like, you know, I was kind of stubborn when I initially got out and was afraid to ask for help. And mm -hmm. don't be afraid to ask for help. It'd be my biggest advice. Like, take it. It's, you've, you've earned it. If anybody's interested in providing a little bit of moral support for Brandon, uh, join us on Sunday, January 30th, here in the Great Hall, and uh, by uh, through a partnership with Rogue, they've donated the equipment to help um, Brandon in his world record attempt. They've also provided equipment for the national kickoff for the Patriot Challenge. So the national kickoff for the Patriot Challenge will be 565 reps, and it will be comprised of three rounds of 500 meters on a C2 rower, 50 calories on an Echo bike, and 15 kettlebell swings. Three rounds of all of those exercises. So that'll, that'll come up to 565 to tie back into the Patriot Challenge and Run Ranger Run. Uh, but join us for the, the, the national kickoff. Join us to, to help Brandon and provide a little bit of moral support.